Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices is made possible in part by CIBC and by the support of these donors. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman and thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, this month's deep freeze has left the city's homeless residents in deadly peril. We'll talk about what some believe Chicago should be doing to protect this population. And how the Protect Chicago Plus program is taking an ambitious approach to vaccinating the community's hardest hit by COVID. Governor J.B. Pritzker reveals his budget plan. What impact does it have on those hardest hit by the pandemic? Protesters are urging the city to stop a metal scrapping company from opening on the southeast side. What both sides have to say. And remembering the Cuban comet, go, go, mini Minoso in tonight's throwback. All beautiful, necessary work that shouldn't be necessary. And a chef gives La Ultima Palabra on how he believes public policy is failing everyone. We do all these things. First off tonight, the sub-zero temperatures and heavy snowfall of the last several days endangered the lives of people who are already incredibly vulnerable. The more than 5,000 Chicagoans estimated to be living on the streets or in shelters, leaving the city and community organizations scrambling to get them to safety. And though the pandemic has complicated access to shelters this year, advocates say this is a problem Chicago has failed to deal with adequately for many years. Joining us now with more are Jose Munoz, Executive Director of La Casa Norte, a nonprofit serving youth and families experiencing homelessness, and 25th Ward Alderman Byron Sigcho Lopez. Gentlemen, welcome both to Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. Alderman, let's start with you, please. You are one of two aldermen who offered their offices as warming centers, the other being uh, Rosanna Rodriguez Sanchez in the 33rd Ward. Um, what went into your decision to do that? Uh, well, it was uh, certainly the, the last resort we saw with the frigid temp temperatures uh, and the growing need in our community. Uh, when we reached out to, to DFSS and, uh, and, um, and other agencies in the city, we were met with a, a simple, uh, with simple instructions like calling 311 uh, and um, and wait for people to go and um, and and stop by viaducts and and, in, and homeless encampments and and we want to wonder, you know, uh, how they how how first of all a lot of these homeless residents can communicate. Many of them don't have cell phones and and also in these frigid temperatures, we cannot simply wait and, and watch as people die in the call. So based on the lack of, of response, uh, we thought it was important to take action to prevent the loss of lives. And, um, and I think that is just unacceptable and that, that we normalize the situation. We need to make sure that we take, we take a proactive action to prevent the loss of lives. And Jose Munoz, what can you tell us about what your organization, La Casa Norte, what have you all seen uh, from the population that you serve in this last couple of weeks? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I think it's it's important to remember that this is a year-round issue. Uh, the frigid temperatures just you know make it more prominent, and folks uh, tend to focus in on those time periods. But the issue of of being able to provide shelter is is happening all all day long, every year. I mean, on any given day, we got about fifteen hundred youth and young adults who are experiencing homelessness in the city of Chicago. Um, and I think you know what we really need to try to focus in on is creating more access points for uh, for individuals to be able to find those emergency services uh, and in their communities in a culturally responsive way. Uh, we need to expand the the amount of affordable housing that's available so that we can get individuals into permanent and supportive housing. And then we and we need to work on the speed that we do that because uh, you know a, a lot of times you know even when there is housing available, if the process takes too long, we tend to lose individuals through that process. Uh, so, so it's great, you know, we, we need to create those points now. It's a problem we need to constantly be looking at throughout the year uh, until we're able to solve this issue. And Jose, sticking with you, how has the pandemic affected your ability uh, to get services uh, to the, the youth that you work with? Um, I mean, it's been a struggle since day one. Uh, I mean, part of the, the issue that we're dealing with is we need to do two things. One, we need to uh, bring in as many folks as possible to be able to provide them with the, the emergency services. But at the same time, we got to do it in a way where we're still able to help individuals socially distance and uh, make sure that we're providing a safe environment for both the clients and the staff that we serve and that are still providing the services. 
So it, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem we're dealing with, but despite that, we've seen an increase in the amount of folks that are looking for services from organizations from La Casa Norte. Try to give you an idea of, of what that growth has looked like during this pandemic. Uh, in 2020, we served a little over 17,000 individuals through all our various programs. Uh, the year before that, we served 5,000. So the more than three times as many individuals are being serviced through the programs and services that we're providing uh, this, this, this past year. Obviously a, a significant increase. Uh, Alderman, are there specific policies that you would like to see the city uh, adopt or even keep um, to, to, you know, to help people who are unhoused, to keep them safe, especially when the, the weather, it's worse than usual? Certainly, and, and as Jose mentioned, this is a, a year, you know, year round issue. We need to certainly invest in more affordable housing, more emergency housing. Uh, that's a, the, the issue of housing is a huge, huge issue in the city of Chicago. We, are, we have a shortage of 120,000 units in the city of Chicago. We have uh, over 80,000 uh, residents out there who, have, uh, who are homeless or in stable housing. We have a serious issue of affordable housing. We need to make sure that we make that a priority. Uh, in the past, you know, for emergencies, we have made park districts available or even CTA buses as warming centers. We haven't done that recently. We can you know, continue doing some of those emergency policies, but ultimately in the long run, we need to make sure that we prioritize affordable housing investment, that we prioritize emergency housing investment, which we're not doing. The other part that is concerning, I think that we, we think sometimes that as homelessness as something that is very, um, uh, rem that can happen to, to anybody, when we know that homelessness is something that can affect to anyone. Lack of shelter, uh, not being able to to have a stable happen can happen to anyone. Just right now, during the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen over 21,000 evictions being filed in in the last months. So we have a serious issue. We need to uh, push for legislation like just cause for eviction, so that we just don't have developers coming in and giving 30-day notices and evicting residents in the middle of a pandemic. There are municipalities and, who are doing that, and, and we also need to make sure we bring relief uh, in a time of a pandemic. We need to invest in public housing, uh, the CHA and other agencies have well, a responsibility. With regard, to, with regard to housing, sorry, I just wanted to get Jose in here one more time. Jose, can you explain the, the housing first model that uh, La Casa Norte advocates for? Yeah, so, so we believe that, you know, there's a lot of issues that we need to deal with, especially in the communities that we're serving. Uh, but the, the very first thing that we need to focus in on is getting them housed. And so uh, the element is correct. I mean, we, we really need to expand the, number, the amount of affordable housing that's out there, create more voucher housing, create it, you know, make it easier for families to, to stay housed. Um, and then we can start dealing with all the other issues uh, that, that we're looking at the community. But housing has to be the first step in making sure if we want to have uh, strong communities, if we want to build resilience in our communities, if we want to see our communities prosper, we have to focus on housing and, and it has to be the top priority. Okay, my thanks to Alderman Sigjo Lopez and Jose Munoz. Best of luck to, to you both in the work that you do. Thank you, Brandon. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to see you. Chicago has launched a COVID vaccine distribution plan that partners with community organizations to get vaccinations to people in the 15 communities most impacted by the pandemic. The plan is called Protect Chicago Plus, and it takes an urgent approach to rolling out vaccinations. We spoke with Carmen Vergara, Chief Operations Officer of one of the partnering organizations about the program as it is in its early days. The uniqueness of this approach is that healthcare has historically always been tied to your employment. And when it's tied to employment, you leave out a lot of people. So people who are part-time workers who don't have health insurance through their employer or people who are unemployed or people who primarily work in the home, uh, that's primarily women. And so this um, Protect Chicago is looking to protect them as well um, who are not represented in the different phases. The community-based organizations that we're partnering with, they are contacting patients through their networks and through phone, banking, through text messaging, through door-to-door um, -door knocking, uh, standing in front of grocery stores, passing out flyers, you know, different methods so that we make sure that we um, can connect with as many residents as possible. We're hoping to change the color of the map. Um, you see that map um, of Chicago that always highlights the disparities on the Southwest side. So we're hoping for, um, you know, equity to be you know, the ultimate outcome of this process. And you can visit our website for more on the city's vaccination rates. That's at WTTW.com slash news. Governor J.B. Pritzker released his nearly $42 billion budget proposal this week. Here's a look at part of what he said. 
I had bolder plans for our state budget than what I'm going to present to you today. It would be a lie to suggest otherwise. But as all of our families have had to make hard choices over the last year, so too does state government. And right now, we need to pass a balanced budget that finds the right equilibrium between tightening our belts and preventing more hardships for Illinoisans already carrying a heavy load. Now, Pritzker's proposal doesn't include tax increases, but instead relies on what he describes as closing corporate tax loopholes. Earlier this week, Amanda Venicky spoke with some state lawmakers to get their reaction to the plan. Here's a portion of that conversation, beginning with Democratic State Senator Christina Castro on whether a tax increase could be a part of what gets passed in the end. I don't see a tax increase. One of the things that we talked about at the Latino caucus had their press conferences where we applauded the governor for not having that. I mean, a lot of our community has been impacted. They're working class families. Many of them rely on some of the state services. I mean, I can tell you, and I'm sure some of my colleagues here can talk about people, friends, family who have been tremendously impacted by, uh, by COVID-19. In addition, when you look at Latino, uh, our Latino community, let's not forget the federal government punished uh, immigrants, the undocumented, and mixed status families. So the state took the step forward to help address that. You know, there, there needs to be help in rental assistance. You have a lot of folks who are underwater uh, and not by choices of their own. This is a global pandemic, and we all have to work together to solve it. And again, as, as Representative uh, Buckner has said, I, again, it's a proposal. I look forward to working with the governor and my colleagues from across the aisle to kind of work this budget um, and to come out with a final product. Representative Bourne, does this budget do anything to chip away at Illinois' long-term financial issues, and should it? Absolutely not. What we see is a doubling down on the decades of failed fiscal policy from a state government that's run almost exclusively by Democrats. We see, um, I would contend, this is a billion-dollar tax increase in the budget. This is new revenue. Democrats and the governor signed these provisions and voted for these provisions in law two years ago, and now they're calling them corporate loopholes. It's going to be businesses paying more taxes and job creators paying a billion dollars in more taxes. We see spending, 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 no serious talks about fiscal reform, no serious talks about righting the fiscal ship. We're in a global pandemic, but Illinois' fiscal issues go back decades. We have to fundamentally change the way that we budget and spend taxpayer dollars in Illinois if we're going to change the outcomes so that generations from now aren't paying these bills. Again, that was part of a conversation Amanda Vinicky had on Chicago Tonight last week when Governor Pritzker unveiled his budget proposal. To watch the full conversation, you can visit our website. Protesters are using a hunger strike to draw attention to a metal scrapping plant that's trying to open a facility on the southeast side. They're calling on the city to deny Reserve Management Group's bid to shut down Lincoln Park metal scrapper General Iron and open Southside Recycling in South Deering. As part of Chicago Tonight's In Your Neighborhood series this week, Amanda Venicky again connected with residents and key stakeholders about the dispute. One of them, Peggy Salazar of the Southeast Environmental Task Force. Amanda began by asking Salazar about pollution in the community. Here's the impact it has. We keep saying that the industry that's here is polluting industry. We are zoned for dirty industry. Dirty industry equates to polluting industry. So every time they add something to what's already here, that it just intensifies those effects. And that's why we've been saying we don't need any more. We, we look at the cumulative impacts of all of this industry. And unfortunately, the regulating industries tend to look at them individually. So they permit each one individually, but that's not how they operate because they all operate together all at one time. And so this is why we don't need any more. Is it that part of this, of course, a lot of this criticism stemming from the shutting down of operations in the Lincoln Park area while looking to expand here, is that really it? Or is there, there no room for any facility like this in Chicago? Well, that's a good question, okay, because we, we definitely, support recycling. Recycling is an important operation, okay? We support it. But we have said many times, and Lincoln Park, the community of Lincoln Park has said, this does not belong, this type of business does not belong in a residential area. Okay? It's a detriment. 
So we've been saying this for a long time. Certain businesses should not be operating in the backyards of communities. And this is what we've been repeating for quite a while, and we're trying to get that changed. Now, representatives of Reserve Management Group say that they have gone to great lengths to make sure that this isn't a major polluter and that, that, that these are myths being espoused by members of the environmental community. What's your response? My response is this. If you need a permit from the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, you are a polluting industry. It's as simple as that. That's why you need a permit, because you will be emitting something into the air, the water, or the ground. The parent company for the new Southside Recycling Facility declined an invitation for an interview this week, but an RMG spokesman was on Chicago tonight earlier this month. He said extra steps have been taken to control pollution. A capture and control system, a filter, a, a thermal uh, oxidizer that burns off volatile organic compounds, um, explosive prevention devices, and uh, a wet scrubber that removes uh, harmful particulate matter and volatile organic compounds from its emissions. Now, Amanda also spoke with 10th Ward Alderman Susan Sedlowski Garza this week. Her ward includes South Deering. Sedlowski Garza is named in a federal complaint related to the Southeast Side facility, which says residents' civil rights were violated when the city decided to allow RMG to move to the Southeast Side. Amanda began by asking Sedlowski Garza about her thoughts on the hunger strike. I'm humbled by by what these folks are doing and uh, people have to understand that you know this action w was generated for, because people felt like they're not being heard right and um, no one should have to starve to be heard they're bring and they brought more attention to the issue which which they're succeeding in what they're doing so I, I'm humbled by their by this movement but it, it's hard for me because you know I had a great relationship with the environmental justice community and um, there's a federal loss. There's a lawsuit. There's a HUD complaint, which I'm named in it. So now I have I can't talk about any of this, um, which it's very hard for me. It's very hard for me. It's a bad situation to be in. Were you told or can you elaborate on why you were included in that complaint? I, I don't have any idea why I was named. And um, I'm actually to, to say that I discriminate against people when I've spent my whole life on the right side trying to fight for working class families in this neighborhood, literally my whole life. And um, you know, yeah, it's, I think it's wrong and it's put a, it's put a huge wedge um, between me and the environmental justice community and it's unjustified. Is that going to hinder their efforts in the long run to prevent this metal scrapping facility from coming to the Well, here, here's one thing that you have to know. The metal, uh, RMG has been in my ward for 29 years. So it's not moving from anywhere. It's been here. Um, you know, it, I, pe but what people have to understand too, folks that live here are 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 very frustrated with the cumulative effect of always getting, you know, um, we're not getting beautiful skyscrapers or, or things like that. We're getting we're getting industry, and there has to be jobs because if you're not if you're not putting food on your table, you're not going to care about anything. But we have to have clean jobs and jobs that don't make people sick. Another question about the facility here, of course, awaiting permitting from the city, even as there is a federal investigation into the state permitting. What is your thought on that? And do you, um, what, what do you have to remark about in terms of the Department of Justice's role in this? Well, I can't really comment on any of that. Okay. Um, I, aldermen do not issue permits. I do not have the ability to issue or deny anything. That is not the role I play. Um, if somebody, any business that comes to the 10th Ward um, files for a permit and if they follow the letter of the law and the rules then they'll get their permit or you could turn around and sue the city for discrimination or whatever so uh, it's it's a hard line you know what I mean and the Lightfoot administration is asking the Environmental Protection Agency for guidance on the permit there's more of this story on our website Beloved White Sox outfielder Minnie Minoso became the first Afro-Latino to play Major League Baseball in 1951 in tonight's throwback from 1995's Remembering Chicago, Sox fans and the Cuban Comet himself reflect on his time as a Comiskey Park favorite and how his fleet feet inspired a peppy theme for the Southsiders. I was the first black who played for the city. And I was the first black who played over there. And I had great, great years. And Minoso was a tremendous catalyst because he could hit, 
He could run and he could field. He had great speed. 51 hour rookie, I make a 7,000. Back in those days, he couldn't go live in the hotel with the whites because that segregation thing was going on then. But he lived at 64th and Maryland. And um, I was living across the street. And he used to sit on his porch. And I used to go and chat with him. And I used to live at 64th and Maryland. Never forget. And I came to the ballpark in a streetcar. And they had a group of young players. And they ran. And they stole bases. And when a man would get on first base, they would start this chant out of the stands, go, go, go. Go, 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 mini, mini, go. So she started, and after that, go, watch out, go, go. I think without I put anything in myself, I started the go, go, White Sox. When Minoso died in 2015, White Sox fan Barack Obama said of him, for Southsiders and Sox fans all across the country, including me, Minnie Minoso is and will always be Mr. White Sox. Up next, La Ultima Palabra with a local chef right after this. Chef Rafael Esparza has worked in some of Chicago's most storied kitchens, including those in his own acclaimed restaurants. And he heaps praise upon others in the city's restaurant community for coming together to help all of Chicago in the last year. But, he says, those efforts are only necessary because government and elected officials aren't doing their jobs. Tonight, Esparza gives La Ultima Palabra on how he believes works of mutual aid give cover to failures of public policy. My name is Rafael Esparza. I'm a lifelong Chicago resident, Pilsen resident to be exact, and I was initially going to talk about mutual aid within the hospitality industry. I started thinking about my friends at Mitokai and Logan Square, at Kimsky and Bridgeport, and about all the, the ways they're help, they're, they show up for the community. And then as I was doing that, I decided to kind of go a different direction. I decided to use the time to speak about things that I feel don't get addressed often enough. We have people setting up warming funds to get hotel rooms for, for homeless people because it's so unsafe out there. Clothing drives for homeless people. Food drives for everyone. Restaurants that have turned into community kitchens to give free meals to people in the community. All beautiful, necessary work that shouldn't be necessary. A lot of people like to chalk it up to government conspiracies or some big like overarching kind of like Illuminati or whatever, but Conspiracies require a lot of secrecy. They require a lot of moving parts. This is policy we're talking about. It's in your face. The way that they target homelessness in this, in this city, the way they criminalize our homeless brothers and sisters is outrageous. Architecture is put in place to keep them from sleeping, to keep them from resting, to keep them tired, to corral them into parts of the city that it's OK for them to be in. This week, it was announced that the, the city of Chicago received $403 million in federal COVID relief funding. And the mayor, Lori Lightfoot, saw fit to give that money to the police, to just hand 65% of it over to the police. The police department is not hurting for money. They have way too much of it. It's an overly militarized police department, one of, the, one of the biggest police budgets in the country, when there are people literally starving to death. I'm standing on a stage of a, of a business that belonged to a friend that's now closed because they couldn't get COVID relief. The fact that our brothers and sisters on the southeast side have to go on a hunger strike to prevent General Iron from opening up a plant, from moving from the rich, white, north side of Chicago to the very brown and black southeast side of Chicago. The effects will be felt for generations, just like they were not in Pilsen and Little, and Little Village when we had the coal plants there. The fact that that isn't a secret, the fact that it's out there, says to you that the policies that are in place are all set up to systemically just keep all of us in check, in place, in our place. But what are we really doing to change anything? How are we really stopping any of this? The time is now to ask for more of yourself and of the people next to you, because clearly no one's coming to help. I've said it before, I'll say it again. 
People come here in pursuit of the American dream. Nightmares are dreams too. And we have information on some of the organizations Esparza mentions offering mutual aid on our website, where you can also watch more in our La Ultima Palabra series. And while you're there, you can also check out our story about Mayor Lightfoot firing back at critics over the decision to use those federal relief funds to cover police costs. That's WTTW.com news. And that's our show for this Saturday night. Join me tomorrow night for Chicago Tonight Black Voices. A damning report from the city's inspector general on the police response to unrest in the wake of George Floyd's killing. And actor Diane Carroll tell, tells a hair-raising story in a 1968 throwback from WTTW's Our People. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, sponsoring a free continuing legal education program for over a decade for lawyers across the state.